morning. This is the Eager Beaver Show. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, The Misfy Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Peppermaster, hot pepper sauces made from farm-fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. Well, good morning and hello, kids, and welcome to season four and episode number 398 of the Daily Beaver Morning Show here on the Cryon Media Network. Yay! Today, recording day is Thursday, June 6, 2024. And um, we have a very special episode for you here today at the Beaver Lodge because it is the 80th anniversary of D-Day. I am your host, the eager beaver pronouns he, him, hey, Mr. Beaver, eh? and with me as always is my good friend, Mr. Grizzly. A big thank you goes to our podcast founding sponsors, The Pepper Master, The Misfy Mysteries from Corp of Moon Publishing, and CanadianTarot.com, Mr. Grizzly. How's your mental health today, sir? You know, uh, all things being equal, which is not truly the case, sadly, but I wish it were, I'm pretty good. Um, I, I don't know why. <laughs> uh, I, I think the brain chemistry is just cooperating right now. And I, I've, you know, to, you know, I've been talking for a while about how my life is about to change drastically. And it's been weighing heavy on my mind, my heart, my soul, eh, my psyche, my identity. Like, I'm losing a lot here. And yet today, I'm like, okay. <laughs> like, literally, that's, I woke up just, okay. You know, I can only control what I can control. I can't control this. I can only control what I can, can control. And what I can control is my emotions and my response to it. So, um, it's not just a matter of deciding to accept and move on. It has a lot to do with the brain chemistry working correctly. Yep. You know, the serotonin transmitters are spitting them out and the receivers are receiving them. So the, the reuptake inhibitors, which is uh, sertraline, is working miraculously for me right now. Woohoo! And I only got five and a half hours of sleep last night. So I woke up tired, but you're feeling, I'm in good spirits and it's cloudy, kind of rainy out today. Mm -hmm. I'm in good spirits. So let's just roll with that. Yes, let's roll with that. Uh, from my end, uh, mental health is really good. Uh, went to play tennis yesterday. Uh, probably shouldn't have because at 5-4, I thought I was going to die. <laughs> Dude, what uh, were you thinking? <laughs> but I won. <laughs> so <laughs> I'll take it. Um, things are great at home. Uh, I'm hoping to uh, stop in Ottawa this weekend because uh, World League of Volleyball is playing in town and I would like to see Team Canada play before the Olympics, so I might mm. do that. Uh, and I have an extra reason to do that because unfortunately, even though my beaver sweetie had managed to avoid it all this time, uh, yesterday he tested positive for COVID. Oh, shit. Yes. So uh, I am wearing a mask indoors, uh, I am going without snuggles, and I am sleeping on the sofa. Yeah. Sorry about that, dude. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, yeah, I'm, I'm, I, 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 so far I'm fine. Mm. Um, but uh, yeah, he, uh, you know, they just had a choral concert, so we suspect it might have something to do with you know choir singing and droplets and you know there's a lot of rehearsals in the in the last lead up and stuff and uh, and lots of seniors in a choir and so maybe they, possibly but i mean we don't know nobody has called us to say that uh, they mm. had tested positive to watch out so um well I, I, yeah i'm hoping i'm hoping because we just had a, a massive employee conference where you know my location where i'm working people flown in from all over the world for this Mm -hmm. uh, and, and yesterday being the busiest day of the week, Wednesday's always the busiest day, but this was like the before times literally. Okay. And, and everybody I spoke to who, who's been there for a while, I was like, yeah, this is pre COVID numbers P for a people in the building. P uh, B people going to help desk, people going here, going there and just getting around because yesterday I, I walked 3.3 kilometers in the building. Okay. <laughs> getting people set up, you know, going floor to floor, because it's a 20 story building, floor to floor to get meetings taken care of, so on and so forth. Uh, each time I'd get in the elevator, it would be jam packed like the pre COVID days. So okay. I'm hoping, I'm hoping nobody was, was sick. You know, even with COVID it's, it's the, um, what is the, you're carrying it, but you're not showing any signs because it's, I can't remember the name of it again. Symptomatic. Thank you. Symptomatic. I wanted to say automatic and I knew that was wrong. <laughs> the way to control it. It's totally automatic. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> automatic. automatic cases and that nobody gets sick after all of this because yeah. um, the, the numbers are starting to spike again with COVID, I've, I've been told. so. Yes, and uh, they're starting to spike. And uh, yesterday, I think it was yesterday or the day before, the government of Ontario announced that, uh, yeah, we don't need wastewater testing anymore. Yeah, thanks, Doug. Jesus. Now, of course, uh, that doesn't really depend on the province. The province was just a coordinating mechanism. Municipalities do that on their own. So hopefully municipalities will hashtag resist and uh, keep doing the wastewater testing on their own, especially since, you know, well, you know, there are small diesel outbreaks and just mm -hmm. a while, just a couple mm -hmm. of weeks ago, there was a meningitis outbreak here near the Beaver Lodge and all that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, stupid decisions again, right? They, they, they told us to make our own health decisions and then they remove all the data. So just like you can't pull yourself up from your bootstraps, if you don't have any boots, you can't make an informed decision about your health if you're not allowed access to any data. Yeah, it's pretty, it's, you know, if people are given the proper information, they usually make the best possible choice. Usually make the usually. best choice. Usually. Yeah. But when you don't have any data, how do you make the choice? Yeah. <laughs> now, kids and cubs, there's lots of news. And I know that mm -hmm. you guys are waiting for my take on it. Um, but today, we are going to set that aside. We're pushing it off for today. Tomorrow, yep. we'll come in hot. Yep. We'll come in hot tomorrow. But today, um, we have an extremely special uh, episode for you because um, we have with us uh, Kit Hugh, Hugh Culleton, who is a military historian and uh, retired Royal Canadian Navy and um, the most popular by yes. far YouTube video that we have on our channel is, on our channel is when Kit Hugh was with us in Remembrance Day on Remembrance Day 2022 uh, to talk about that. That one I had passed the the thousand um, viewers on our YouTube mm -hmm. page uh, when we were really really just starting, uh, which was amazing, and because uh, like we don't even have a thousand subscribers yet. Although my mental health is doing very good because we had a huge jump. We are at nine hundred and seventy seven, and was at eight hundred and fifty when I went to bed. So um, I don't seventy eight. Advertising works, I guess. So we I picked uh, up another I'm one during, we, during this. We're at 978 now. <laughs> yeah, I'm guessing. 979, might... two more since we logged on this morning. <laughs> All right. So I'm guessing uh, we might hit the, that 1,000 before Canada Day. So thank you so much. Uh, but uh, back then, uh, <laughs> Hugh broke the bank, essentially, for us. <laughs> we had never been that popular. Uh, so uh, we asked him if he would be able to come on today to speak to us about today and he has uh, very graciously agreed now uh we're having a couple of tech things uh now and then uh, i don't know if he's still with us yeah he's still here uh, he's, he's still here okay uh he's his, his signal issues though so. yeah signal issues 
So the visual might not be great, but I think the audio works the audio well. Is, the audio is great. So let's bring him on in, shall we? Put your paws up. Give a big round of a pause for Kit Hugh. Oh, and Hello. now we have no sound. <laughs> no. We can't hear you, sir. <laughs> uh, the audio was technology. perfect in the green room. <laughs> uh, okay, hang on a sec. Technology. I will, uh, I'll call him. Yes. I'll call him and I'll put him on the phone. So yes. just give me a minute, Hugh, and uh, I'll keep, we'll keep this channel open. But I'll give him a call, and it might be just an audio-only interview. So, sir, if you yes. can wax poetic for a moment while I get some things set up on my end. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. Now, uh, one of the reasons uh, I wanted uh, Kit Hugh to come on is because, um, well, you know, uh, as a beaver, I'm, uh, I've crossed the half-a-century mark. And um, it's been a very long time since my uh, World War II unit in history class in high school. So um, I know D-Day is important. I mean, we all know D-Day is important. Um, but maybe it's been a little while um, since we've had a refresher on uh, what it meant and what it was about. Now, unlike Mr. Grizzly, I'm not from a military family. Uh, my brother has indeed served, um, but uh you know, my parents didn't, my grandparents didn't, and that type of stuff. So I'm not from a military family. Um, I am, um, you know, we learned about the Second World War in history class. There's what I got from movies and, you know, and picking up stuff here, here and there. Hey, just a sec. Uh, yeah. we've, we've got him. We've got Hugh. Okay. Hugh, are you there, sir? I am. Perfect. Greetings Thank you. To the Beaver Lodge and all the family. Hello, my friend. How are you today? And how's your mental health? I was just going to play the MLC. Pardon? Ah, c'est très bien, merci. Ah, c'est très bien, merci. Yeah. Ah, c'est en français. C'est fantastique. C'est fantastique. Je parle un peu. Je, je suis à, à travail. Ah, tu es au travail. I think, think I just blew basically my, my, my vocab for the day. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah, we're doing okay up here. Um, I'm, I've, I've switched berths, as they say in the Navy. So I've shifted berths from uh, uh, Belleville. So I'm now actually based out of Lakefield and looking after my dad right now. He, like, like uh, Alex, unfortunately, is is currently under the weather as well. Not with the same same issue, but he's he's got a bad cough. So I'm just doing my best to nurse him back to health. Oh, anyway, right. I'm so sorry to okay. hear. Please, uh, please so, send good. Hold on, hold on. Please send him some uh, good vibes for us, uh, because uh, I will certainly do that. We are hoping to have um, um, Kit Hughes' dad. Uh, something with him uh either pre-recorded or something uh for remembrance day this year uh because your dad did serve yeah. correct yes yes Kit Hughes, dad and and well, I'm, I'm working on the book uh, uh that's going to be a three-part book on him my grandfather and my great uncle Lori. great uncle Lori was a was an raf group captain i mentioned him the last time i was on mm -hmm. uh he won the distinguished flying cross my grandfather was an rcaf test pilot during the war and he ran the ontario provincial air service both before and during the war he's a bush pilot old school bush pilot from like 1924 and my dad started off in flying in the bush up north in ontario for the opas and went on to uh uh, fly Air Canada 747s before he finally retired not too long ago. So the, the three of them, between them, have about, uh, oh God, about uh, uh, 155 years of flying experience. So, and, uh, and uh, so, so the, uh, and I've got their memoirs and I've got their, the, the background. So I'm, I'm just trying to massage that into a, into a text and I'm reaching out to the, on, to the Canadian Aviation Historical Society, uh, and uh, and Larry Milbury and uh, Dave Hadfield and some of the other guys who uh, who've got some uh, some some background and some information for me and pictures and things like that. So I'm just putting that together. What remind me? Did was your father part of the crew of the Gimli Glider? No, he wasn't. He knew those guys. He knew and, them. And okay. uh, he he like he, he knew both of them very well. Right. And uh, and it was a the Gimli Glider. Actually, one of my one of one of his best friends, uh, um, Mac McFarlane, ran the newspaper in uh, in Selkirk, Ontario, just like just near Gimli, mm -hmm. and was the uh, first photographer on the scene to uh, actually capture the picture of the plane on the on the end of this drag strip with everybody looking at it funny. 
They, had, they were lucky, actually. The nose gear didn't actually, because they because they had to do an emergency landing and they didn't have hydraulics mm. for emergency, the nose gear was going against the wind. It didn't quite lock in place, so it skidded along in its nose, which actually slowed it down. It was better braking yeah. effect than, than <laughs> if it landed on wheels. But, uh, no, I've got a picture. I've got a big picture of the by Ken Glossy somewhere of it uh, sitting there with its nose down and the ramps out and everybody's standing around scratching their heads wondering what the heck happened. Because it's really, it's really interesting. Anybody who, well, you're, 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 you're an Air Force brat, so you know yes. this. Yes. Oh, yeah. Anybody who's ever been near an airplane or, or like a jet plane knows that when they come in, sometimes if they're coming towards you, like from behind or through terrain, you, they can really sneak up on you really quickly. Even an F-18, which is louder than anything, mm-hmm. it can really sneak up on you quick. So all these people are doing their drag racing, then they turn around, then there's a silent jet just coming right in at them. But okay. some uh, 67s don't glide very well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can, you, can I ask you, uh, I don't know where it is. Okay, yeah, because uh, on the screen, it looks like you're not looking, you're, you're looking sideways. Say again, you're last. We we have you. Your your camera is open. We can see you oh, on screen. So, awesome. yes. Oh, okay, so we got the audio from your phone. Yeah. So just lean over to your left a little bit, so we can get you more in frame. There you go. There we go. It's a little blurry, awesome. but we've got okay. full audio. So that's the important factor, right? Okay. Um. So uh, we have uh, some. Uh, yeah, we have comments from the uh, the kits here. Uh, Hugh uh, wishing uh, uh, sending good vibes to your dad and all that kind of stuff. Um. Well, pass on the best wishes. Thank you very much, everyone. All right. Um, Kid Hugh, um, please, uh, if you would, uh, maybe just refresh us to start with on uh, what is D-Day and uh, why it is that we make uh, a point to observe it. Certainly. Okay. Now, D-Day is is one of these uh, historical pivot points in, in world history. They, they come along every now and then. Nobody knows when they come, but it's an inflection point. Um, it's, it, it didn't, it wasn't, it wasn't the, the, the end of the war by any stretch. Mm-hmm. Would the war have been won without it? Maybe. Um, but what it, what it did allow, uh, what, it did, what did happen on, on D-Day on, on June 6, 1944, 80 years ago today, uh, was without doubt one of the, one of the uh, most impressive uh, displays of organization and logistics and uh, training and uh, commitment that we've ever seen in in, uh, in modern history. World War One was a brutal bloodbath. Canada figured out, like the Canadian Army, the Canadian Corps, uh, figured out how to how to not just survive this trench warfare, as Bill Rawlings wrote about, but how to master it and how to basically uh, how to how to win it. Uh, by the end of the First World War, the Canadian Corps had successively taken on and destroyed over a quarter of the entire German army. That's one corps versus yeah. about 85 corps. And wow. they did it, one after the other. Hammer Bores, the last hundred days of the war. I highly recommend a book by, by a good friend of mine, Shane Schreiber, Colonel Schreiber from the PPCLI, uh, called Shock Army of the British Empire. That was the Canadian Corps in the First World War. So mm-hmm. after the First World War, though, being Canada... We basically we dismantled our military. We went right back down to square one. Mm-hmm. So we were we were at the same stage that we're kind of at right now. We've got we've got a small cadre of uh, of regular force. We've got uh, reserve units across the country and and militia units. Militia being being Canadian Army speak for reserve formations, and uh, and and that was about it. And it's underfunded, undermanned, uh, very quiet. And uh, I mean, right now, I think we'd, we'd be we'd be lucky if we've got if we got fifty five thousand people in uniform right now. All right, when World War Two started up, like in the in the offing to it, the British were uh, by nineteen thirty six realized the war was coming, so they were already starting to ramp up their production, uh, get their stuff together, and figure out how to how to how to uh, defend their 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 territories and their empire from from uh, from a, the the. the German threat that was rising because they could see exactly what Hitler was doing. I think personally, this is me. I think Neville Chamberlain got a bad rap because his little scrap of paper, everybody says he was a fool. He wasn't. What he did was he bought time for the British to get their act together and build up their aircraft production and get their organization in place. Now, World War II was fought in phases. The first phase was all completely on the defense. Uh, Great Britain, 
didn't lose the war because they, they were able to defeat the, the Germans in the, in the Battle of Britain. In retrospect, looking back and knowing what was going on in the, in the Luftwaffe and in the German military, the Germans never really had a smoking chance because they didn't really understand what they were doing. They didn't have an operational um, uh, policy or an operational plan that was infused through their armed forces about how to fight a war against, against Britain. They were making it up as they go along. And they were tweaking on methamphetamines. There's a good book about that called Blitzed, and it's about the uh, use of methamphetamine in Nazi Germany. Um, right. And they're, I mean, they're giving out literally like candy to children. Oh yeah, because they had too many, too much work, and too few people. So what you do is you just give everybody meth, and then they can work a lot better. But anyways, <laughs> it's okay until it's not okay. Anyway, right. So their organization was 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 organizationally and operationally inefficient and completely messed up. The British, on the other hand, um, the, uh, under Sir Hugh Dowding, uh, Air Marshal Hugh Dowding, who got a bad, like he got basically uh, cashiered at the end of this and went off to, was, uh, was the liaison officer to the United States for the rest of the war, which I think is a tragedy because the Dowding system, he basically took fighter command. They broke up their, they broke their, um, their, their entire uh, defense forces, their air forces into, into three groups, so you, into three bomber command, three, three, coastal and command, and fighter, and fighter command. And fighter. With fighter command, what they had they was, had was a, a, a with sectors oops, hold on. Uh, throughout, throughout Britain. They, uh, yeah, you need to kill your, you need to kill your, kill your speakers. Kill, 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 kill. Your, your speakers are on. Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, did oh, it? Did it. Yeah. yeah. Okay, okay, hang on. Here, try it now. How's that? Yeah, just, yeah. There you go. Better? Perfect. Okay. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So in in uh, in in uh, uh, fighter command, they they broke down the entire English coast into sec into sectors. They had what they called chain home, which is a radar system, which allowed them to see the Germans coming in. They were able to uh, create basically an analog computer system for controlling every aircraft and every asset. So they were scrambling aircraft in groups of two or three that would go out and, and attack the specific German formations that were coming in. And uh, it, it allowed them to basically maximize their defense. Okay, so that saved that part of the war. Now, by 1944, things are going badly against, against uh, Germany. Uh, they are getting their asses handed to them by the Russians who have learned how to out blitzkrieg them. They were able to go into, into uh, uh, Russia and roll up a tremendous amount of land but the Germans, again, didn't realize that logistics is what wins wars. Amateurs study tactics, professionals study logistics. And when you've got a logistics train that is going to be 2,000 kilometers long through uh, territory that is, not, that is not under your total control, you run into some problems and difficulties. So they basically, they ran out of oomph. And by the time that they ran out of oomph, the Russians were able to start rolling them back. So while this is happening in, 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 in Russia in the summer of 1944, the Allies, the Western Allies, are being screamed at by Russia, who's doing a lot of the dying, to open up a second front. Mm -hmm. Their first attempt at this was, of course, the, well, North Africa in, in, uh, in Operation Torch, where the Americans, when they first came into the war in 1942, but then after that, we moved off to uh, the first time that the Canadians actually got heavily involved, and that was the invasion of Sicily, Operation Husky. And that was the, the seaborne assault on Sicily. A lot of lessons were learned there, including mm -hmm. how to drop paratroopers, because a lot of paratroopers got dropped over the ocean and drowned on their way in. So, but anyways, the Canadian Army uh, sent. We had we had uh, we had uh, 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 two divisions that were that were deployed there. Um, turned it into a, a, a small corps, and that's where the Canadian military and leadership uh, really got their operational training and understanding about how to both work with a coalition and coalition warfare with the, with the British and the, and the Americans, as well as how to, how to fight and win against the Germans. And of course, it was a brutal grind up the, up the uh, peninsula in the boot of Italy. In fact, one of my uh, one of my cousins, uh, Fred Culleton, is buried in Cessna Cemetery, uh, where he was he was a forward observing officer with the um, oh gosh, uh, uh, it was a Eastern Eastern Ontario Regiment. Um, I'll come to meet. Anyways, but he was he was a forward observing officer directing artillery fire, and he got hit by a German eighty eight. Anyways, so we 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 have all these lessons learned now. While that's going on. 
the Canadian army is also building up its forces incredibly in, in Britain. Britain has become the uh, basically the unsinkable aircraft carrier assault ship off the coast of Nazi Germany and, and, and Nazi-controlled Europe. And so the Germans know that they're going to be coming eventually and sometime. They set up as, as best they can through the TOT organization a, uh, a system of defenses that they call Festung Europa or, or Fortress Europe. So basically a series of interlocking defensive positions with artillery and uh, mines and. Oh, oh no. We oh, no. <laughs> it froze just as he was getting to the best part. Oh. Oh. It, it took them up until Hugh, Hugh, about Hugh. the ninth zone. Sorry, sorry, you froze after you said they had artillery. We didn't hear anything. You, uh, if you defend everywhere, you're defending nowhere. And they didn't know where the where the where the landing was going to come. Now, while while this is going on in 1943-44, and the Germans are fighting hard against the Russians, the Russians are again screaming for for the Canadians or for the, the Allies to to do something. So that's why we get to the Dieppe raid. Dieppe was a combined operation between uh, Britain and Canada. Canada supplied most of the infantry forces, some of the naval forces, um, and uh, but it was it was under the overall command of uh, of uh, Mountbatten. Was for better or worse, he was a dilettante. He was he he they they like it was it was a debacle. They got bounced going in the the formation of ships that were going in to do this massive huge raid got bounced by a German convoy, a coastal convoy they didn't know about. They didn't do proper research or reconnaissance beforehand. The beach is what they call shingle. So like, you know, those big round rocks you see down on on uh, uh, like the Lake Ontario there, like that that really loose stuff that's really hard to, mm. to walk on. That's basically mm. what the beach at, at Dieppe was, mm. which meant that the tanks couldn't do anything. There right. was a six foot seawall at the end of the beach that they couldn't climb. They didn't have any way of breaching it. And both ends of the beach were covered with from from heights with artillery and machine guns, and it turned it into what they call an end flood or an end flood uh, fire zone. So basically, they're getting hit by fire from the front and from both flanks. So it was a debacle. We lost a lot of people. the The division that fought there, Second Canadian Division, was the one that was supposed to be in the in the main landing at at, at D Day in, in forty four. They were burned out. Um, their entire force was was had to be rebuilt, and so three Canadian division under Keller was tasked with doing it. The okay, so the one lesson that they learned from this, so they really shouldn't have had to learn, because I mean the lessons that they were learning were known throughout history. I mean it was just basic common sense. You do prior reconnaissance. You learn where the enemy is, you figure out what you need to do, and then you deploy your forces in the most efficient way possible in order to meet those objectives and support them. Well, anyways, it caused the British and the American and Canadian, the high commands, to go back and to plan from scratch and to say, right, we really have to do this differently. So from about 1943 on, the war enters a different perspective. It's like in this World War, up until about 1916, it was amateurs running the, in the the show and people like pulling ideas out of their butts and, and trying to make everything work. By 1917, it had turned into a professional organization. Same thing in the Second World War. It takes a few years for your systems to build up to get the right people with the right experience and training into the right positions in order to make the thing work. By the time that, uh, that summer of 1944 came around, we had an incredibly precise plan like the operation order for operation overlord which is the entire uh, uh, invasion of of uh, of europe um it was broken down into two parts it was broken down into the into the landing and there's also operation neptune which was the naval portion of this the the operations order ran i think about 900 pages it read like the bible Whoa. like absolutely everything down to where how you're going to load uh, ammunition and food and supplies into the landing craft so that when the guys hit the beach, they've got the things they need first right away. And then as they move in, then they've got right. the access to everything. So they, they had a very, very good organization down. In order to do this, they realized from Dieppe that you they had like, anytime you're, you're launching a, uh, a, a 
an assault. It's got to be, it's, it has to be overwhelming. You have to, you have to apply a lot of force because one defender can usually stand up against maybe two or three attackers, especially when they're coming in without cover against a, against a defended position and expect it. So what do you do? They use deception. Patton was given a fake army made up of inflatable tanks, as we are now seeing and used in, in uh, Ukraine, by the way, to, to mm -hmm. uh, attract drones away from actual assets um, in, in the north of England, so that it looked like maybe they were going to hit right across the coast at Pas de Calais, which is where the Germans thought that they wanted, they were going to come, and the British and the Americans uh, did their absolute best, like the Allies did their absolute best to convince them of that. Part of warfare is deception. That's one of the basic cardinal rules of war. Best way to do that is to make the enemy believe what they want to believe. Don't try to make them believe something they don't want. You want just if they want if they think you're going to go to Calais, you put things out there like like bombers and uh, reconnaissance aircraft and ships off the coast, and you make it believe that they're that that's where it's going to be. And that's what they did. About a quarter of the of the Allied tactical air assets. That were that were deployed against France in in advance of the of the uh, Normandy landings, were deployed well away from Normandy. They were they were going north, they were going south, they were going all over the place, so that the Germans didn't know where this was going to happen. That the only chance they had was was to maximize their ability to to be unexpected. Now, going back to so that's that's the the background here. If we if we want to look at this, I think the best way to uh, to talk about uh, uh, the entire battle is to look at from the perspective of the three branches. So you've got an air component, you've got a land component, and you've got a sea component. I'll start with the sea component because I'm a sailor. The uh, the Operation Neptune was at that point the largest. Um, naval assault or and largest naval force ever assembled in human history there were well over 7000 different vessels involved about 250 of those were canadian remember also that at this point in time canada was the was the um uh the the uh, force that was in charge with transporting and and uh, all the supplies safely across the atlantic so the United States Navy wasn't in charge of Atlantic operations, despite what that horrible Tom Hanks movie um, about the destroyer says. If, if, if that were an actual real movie, the Canadian Corvettes would have been the, uh, the scoper or the, or the senior ship present and uh, giving the orders. Wouldn't be an American on his first tour because they didn't know what they were doing at that point in the war. But anyways, I digress. The the so the Canadian Navy is is which at this point is also the third largest by number of ships in the world is is uh, tasked with uh, maintaining the the lines of communication across the Atlantic, um, taking out uh, and and hunting and killing all the submarines. And by this time, we're getting very very good at that. We still also have an offensive force that is used tactically. So destroyers like Haida and Huron and uh, Algonquin are going to be along the shore with their with their uh, five inch and, and 4.7 inch guns uh, lending fire support pinpoint fire support everybody thinks well battleships are great but a 16 inch battleship round it's well they're impressive as heck because it's like 3,000 pounds of Volkswagen going over your head at, at about 2,500 feet per second they only can do so much and they're not very accurate for taking out beach defenses in order to in order to support the the landing in order to suppress positions, they needed a lot of firepower from smaller ships that could direct it very quickly. And so they had to build an organization between the ships and the shore, the beach masters and the landing craft in order to organize this entire system. Absolutely phenomenal organization. The entire invasion had to be led first, though, by minesweepers. The Germans had mined the entire channel. Uh, and we're talking like those big old mines there with the with the horns all over them that go that you punch into and they, they blow up and things like that. They were they were all over the place. So what they had to do is they had to send in under fire a mines a force of minesweepers to sweep the channels ahead of them, uh, planes ahead of the landing craft so that they could actually get into the beach. One of the pictures I shared with you, I don't know if I shared with you. I probably should have uh, and I didn't. But anyways they they had to set up an organization and a navigational system where each beach had light ships way out in the in the uh, in the middle of the uh, channel, 
that were that were anchored in specific spots. So when the when the uh, landing craft came in, they knew exactly where they were going. So they basically like an airport uh, sorts you out into which flight you're going into. All these ships are coming across. It's rough as heck because well, we'll get into the weather in a bit. But th so they had to they had to do all this and they had to do it very quickly and they had to do it in the dark and they had to do it before the landing ships were able to were able to get there while they were still underway. Hmm. D-Day was not supposed to happen on the 6th. It was supposed to have gone in about a week before. But because okay. of the weather, the weather. Yeah. over the North Atlantic, and, and, and weather usually goes from west to east, does here in, in the Northern Hemisphere, they had to wait for proper conditions because the uh, the Normandy coastline is not is it's an exposed oceanic coastline. Uh, you get some of the largest uh, waves in in Europe in in the North Atlantic or in, in from the North Atlantic because it, it gets channeled in, it gets funneled in, and as it as it shelves and, and shallows these waves build up into massive huge swells and you can't land ships you can't land troops safely if if you've got that if you've got too rough a sea they had to wait for the right conditions do you not find the they, irony in that though can't land it. them safely because they're about to march into machine gun fire <laughs> yep well there's well even yeah, that's that that is even secondary at this point right now we just have to get the guys to the beach before that happens you have to prepare the the uh, the beach for the landing how do you do yeah. that? Okay, that's where the Air Force comes in and where a big, huge bun fight happened about a couple months previous, three months previous, where Bomber Harris, like Arthur, or Arthur Harris, who is the head of, he's the Air Marshal in charge of, of Bomber Command, including 6th Group, which was the Canadian Air Force um, uh, portion of, of the heavy bomber force. His primary mo mo mission and purpose in life is to reduce Germany to nothing. He realizes very quickly on, because he's a very pragmatic man, that his bombers, unlike the Americans who think that they've got this really tricky-dicky uh, uh, Norton bomb site that can that can hit uh, a, a pork barrel from from thirty-five thousand feet, which it never could. It was a, it was a, it just didn't work. And they believed in daylight bombing so they could be precision and really tight formations of bombers so they could cover each other off and protect each other from from. Uh, from uh, um, enemy fighters and things like that. Well, anybody who's seen that uh, show, uh, uh, Masters of the Air, mm -hmm. it didn't work out very well. Their American attrition rates and even Bomber Command attrition rates early on in the war while they were learning the, these lessons were on the order of infantry at the Somme in 1916. Wow. Like, okay, for people who maybe don't know what that if is. You're, how... If you were like a 30, a 30 uh, mission tour, which is what was expected in uh, in the RCAF you had a 1 in 25 chance of actually making that it wasn't a matter of if you're going to sh get shot down or, or or injured or killed it was a win and yet these guys still got in these planes and they're like i mean i mean i i i had the had the honor when i learned how to fly uh, my flight instructor was uh, was uh, frank montgomery who was a i think he retired he was a squadron leader so like a major he um he was a Pathfinder pilot flying a Mosquito bomber, twin engine wooden bomber, over over Germany to mark the targets with uh, with flares and uh, and uh, white phosphorus bombs and things like that, so that the bomber streams coming behind him, the Lancasters and the Halifaxes would be able to see where the targets were. That was dangerous work. The man was was like he didn't wear he didn't fly a plane. He just put it on, strapped it on, and wore it like you and I would wear socks. It was it was pretty awesome to watch him fly. Anyways, so they had to, they had to, so Bomber Harris's job is this. He sees strategic bombing as being the only way that they, that they, they can use their, that, that, that force to bring the most hurt to the enemy as possible and end the war as quickly as possible. He's extremely pissed off at Eisenhower for demanding that, that Bomber Command gets taken off of this and put on to preparation for Normandy. So there's a major fight there. But Harris being a professional... He puts up the uh, he puts up the fight as best he can, but when he's given his marching orders by his by his bosses, he says yes, sir, and he gets on with it and he does it very very well. A German um, officer, uh, an Oberst um, uh, Hans von Luck, is he wrote a book about well I think it's called Panzer Commander, but the he he uh, he was in Normandy as a as a uh, uh, well 
uh, what was it? It was a Kampfgruppe von Luck, so so fighting group von Luck. So he had a he had a an amalgamation of forces, mostly based around some tanks and some armored personnel carriers and things like that. He described one of these heavy bomber uh, attacks behind the line into into uh, the the area like where the reserve troops were forming up at Normandy, and he said it was absolutely overwhelmingly stunning. There were tanks by the by the time the bombers were done. There were there were eighty ton tanks and vehicles that were flipped over on their back. People were just wandering around in a in a stunned uh, fog, bumping into trees, and uh, and it was it was he said it was it was completely devastating and demoralizing. Now, so that's what they're doing. So they're using the heavy bombers to to uh, destroy communications between the rear areas where the central where the Germans have their have their uh, reserve forces, second uh, or twenty first Panzer uh, division, which is a very good division. Um, uh, the the friggin' Hitler Jugends under under uh, under uh, uh, Kurt Meyer, who should have been shot as a war criminal. He actually he executed some Canadian prisoners. He got. And, uh, and and a few other of these formations there. So they basically are creating a barrier of destruction between where the enemy supplies and support troops are and where their forward units are. So you basically are isolating the, uh, the forward elements from their support. Once they've got that done and they're doing that in about the week beforehand, and remember, they're also doing this all the way up and down the entire seaboard because it's important to make sure that, that the deception stays in place and to keep the Germans believing where that, that's going to be Padre as long as humanly possible. While that's happening, they've got, the, uh, they've got their forces lined up and mustered in Portsmouth and every little uh, port along the southern part of the coast of, of England. 7,000 ships filled with troops, filled with equipment, filled with artillery. Uh, There's some that were specifically designed for this operation. Uh, the uh, You might have heard of something called a funny tank. There were these things. If you go up to the War Museum in Ottawa and you get a chance to look, there, there are these Sherman tanks there with these with these uh, uh, canvas screens that they would put up like, like awnings around them and seal them off, sort of. Uh, and then they could float these tanks with a little motor on the back there, a little propeller at the back there. So they would swim into the shore so that when the, when the uh, soldiers were ashore, they realized that they needed, uh, our, they needed uh, tank support, armored support, right away in order to take out and clear the pillboxes, the artillery positions, and, uh, and, and suppress the, the enemy while the, while the soldiers moved in to, to, uh, to breach the defenses and get in behind them. Not all of those guys made it ashore, especially in rough water, because the freeboard on them was about six inches. And I don't think you need to know that a, 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 a Sherman tank doesn't float very well. And they go from there down to the bottom. Most of these guys who were driving, were actually, I met, I met one of them from the, was it the Ontario Regiment? Yeah, he's the Ontario Regiment down in Oshawa. He, he said, yeah, we, we basically, we rigged up uh, boards and everything so we could steer and control them with our feet so we would be sitting on the deck so that when the thing sank, we might have a chance of getting out. Anyways, Jeez. So they get yeah. those in, in shore. They have other tanks that have massive, huge fascines on them to, to breach the uh, seawalls. They've got other tanks that are designed, well, they're equipped like with, with uh, uh, flamethrowers, with 240 millimeter spigot mortars, things like that. Like, like they did, a, they, they, the, the amount of detail that went in planning that went into D-Day is off the charts. And it was successful. We had five beaches. The Americans were in the south. Britain was in was just to the north and to the and to the south of the Canadian at Juneau, um, so it was Gold, Juneau, Sword, Utah, Omaha. I think I got those backwards, but those were the the uh, code names for the beaches. Each of them had a specific uh, task and a specific operation. On the Canadian sector, it was three Canadian division that was tasked with the landing. Of three Canadian division, you had the uh, well. I think it was the they were they did it. They when when you do a when you do a military operation, usually it's think of triangles. You will either have a situation where if you're advancing to contact, you will have one up and two back as they call it. So you've got a formation, one formation in front that will make contact with the enemy, and two uh, formations behind on on either side of them, so you can you can maneuver them to assault. Uh, the the position once it's fixed in place by the by the company or the the unit in, in, in advance, or you have two up and one back. 
uh, usually for two up and one back, which is what they did at, 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 at D-Day, that is for maximum shock. What we're talking about when you do an assault like this is, well, you, Schwarzkopf called it shock and awe. It's, it's shock warfare. It really, really is a brutal and basic as football. You are literally pushing and marching people forward into the fire, getting them as far forward as possible, as fast as possible. Your only way that you're going to not die in greater numbers is if you get people off the beaches, get them undercover and get them through the enemy defenses as fast as possible. So that's so they had so they went up with that. So there was there was the uh, third Canadian division with with seventh armored brigade as a as a an armored force that was in support of them offshore. You had battleships, everything from uh, from battleships all the way down to landing craft filled with rockets and even 25 pounder like land based artillery guns that were coming in to the beach. These guys were were were, were firing rounds and just to thicken up the barrage as they were going into the beach and probably weren't going to hit anything, but it but it kept the enemy's head down and suppresses them until you get your your troops as close as possible to them. Anybody who's ever been around a rifle range or has ever served like in the in the military and done done the uh, the the work where you're you're in the in the butts when you're doing a, a, a range shoot knows that like when bullets are flying past you, it sounds like a firecracker or a whip being cracked by your head. Bigger bullets are are louder, smaller bullets are sharper, uh, but but you hear all the snap, 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 snap going off all around you. That is so. So it doesn't always. It doesn't matter if you're actually hitting the enemy in some situations, as long as you are suppressing their positions. If you've got the guys in their bunkers who are scared to go up and look out their 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 slit windows or or shoot out because there's concrete dust chipping in their face there and they hear all this noise going on, that's okay. That's perfect because that will allow you to get your troops up as close as possible to drop satchel charges and grenades into it or flamethrowers and to destroy these positions. So there was there was some, uh, the only issues, Canada did really well at, uh, at, at the beach. We were able to get through the beach. We were able to get into the towns and get through the enemy defenses um, fairly effectively and quickly on the first day. We were able to make our, make our objectives. The Americans to the, to the south, where they were actually going up against a fairly steep cliff, had some more difficulty, as seen in Saving Private Ryan. Right. That sometimes in uh, in history classes, uh, just the first portion of that movie, and uh, it's I, I I call it Omaha Beach. Aren't you glad that you weren't mm -hmm. there? Um, because, like as as much as you as much as you can ever get anything real from a movie because you don't have the smell, you don't have the actual overwhelming, overpowering sound, you don't have the 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 fear and the sense of sense of dread of what you're doing because. If you've ever walked or if you ever get a chance to walk on the beaches of Normandy or Dieppe, the very first thing that that uh, strikes you is how flat and open it is everywhere. There is no cover anywhere. So the moment that door falls down and you guys are walking out through the surf ashore, you're alone. Yeah. It's, it's, it's alone. It, it, I can't, I, I mean, I've never done that, but I can only imagine how terrifying it would be. You're, you're, you're suddenly, you're just, you're, you're there and you, you don't have any, you don't have any cover. You don't have anything to do except go for it as fast and as far as you can and hope for the best. It's you basically what these guys were doing, like, like sometimes like when it's raining and people put their heads down and walk into the rain, that's what they were doing. MG uh, 42s, the, the standard German machine gun had a cyclic rate of fire of 600 rounds a minute of eight millimeter ball ammunition. So that's 192 green bullets that are flying out at about 2,500 feet per second, 600 a minute. You do a barrel change and you can keep up that rate of fire all day. Um, so it doesn't take a lot of guys who have got an, a defended, uh, protected and armored position and enough ammunition, unless you, unless you can get past that, you're you they're, they're they're going to win rommel said this right off the bat when he when he set up and it was it was erwin rommel who planned most of the at the at the senior level i mean it was it was engineers that actually did it all but he he planned most of the beach defenses and the way that they were going to lay out their 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 defense for for fortress europe 
He realized Germany, the only way that's we're going to right? get this or the only Hugh? way we can win Hugh. is Hugh, 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 stop Hugh. them right at the tide line. We cannot let them get past the beach. Once they get inland, we're well, we're screwed. The, again, you can't do anything about that. So his so his fo his focus was to was to ensure that the that the forces required were as far forward as possible, so that they could react very quickly and reinforce the areas that needed to be reinforced as quickly as possible. It didn't work out that way for a couple of reasons. Going back to what I said at the beginning, this is a war effort being run by meth heads. They like. Hitler and his and his uh, his political leadership and the military leadership were a bunch of yes men that were reporting to him. The uh, making the Fuhrer happy was vastly more important than actually ensuring that that uh, the operations were carried out uh, successfully. I mean, people say that that Germans are very efficient and everything. Well, not not so much in the in the Nazi command. They lost the war for very sound reasons. Uh, one of which was their logistics and their their ability to to coordinate a national war effort was was not great. For example, uh, a Heinkel 111 bomber from say 19, late 1930s, early 1940s that they used to bomb Britain in the Blitz. They cost approximately two thousand dollars, or sorry, two thousand Reichmarks to to build. Say the survival rifle in them was a handmade. Uh, drilling because Hermann Goring like like hunting and everything. So it's a it's a double barrel shotgun rifle with a with a with a single rifle barrel underneath, a beautiful thing. And the, but those things all by themselves cost about fifteen thousand Reichmarks. So you're putting you're putting a as a survival weapon for a bomber that might crash. Um, you're putting a, a a weapon that is more that is more valuable and more resource intensive than the entire friggin' airplane that it's supposed to be working for. So these were sort of their problems. Same with their armor and their tanks. They didn't they didn't uh, design things with reliability and maintenance in mind. A lot of people degrade the or denigrate the uh, the Sherman, saying that you know it's, it it wasn't as good as a German tank. Well, it was because one, um, uh, what is it that uh, that the that the Russians say? You know, uh, mass has a has a quality all its own, or quantity has a quality all its own. Same thing with the with the um, with the um, 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 the Shermans, they had they they had an industrial base. Canada was pumping them out like crazy. America was. Everybody was using them. So all the equipment standardized. So it was Canadian, British, American doesn't matter. Everybody's got the parts. So they can help each other out. Um, all these tanks are easy to service. You can do an engine swap on a on a Sherman, and a lot of them are using aircraft engines. Actually, uh, you can do an engine swap on a on a Sherman in maybe about two or three hours. German, you had to put it on a, on a uh, trailer, put it on a, on a uh, uh, train, take it all the way back to the factory, and it had to be taken completely apart, re-engined, re-whatever done, and then put back in the field. It was incredibly inefficient. Plus, there, by that time, by 1944, because of Bomber Command, because of the, uh, ex the, the, the way the war was progressing, they didn't have access to the strategic materials, copper, um, aluminum, and, and various metals like, like um, um, magnesium and, and, th and things like that, that they needed in order to, to uh, keep up their production. So, all right, so we get to the beach. We've got our, we've got our Canadians ashore. They're moving inland. Um, while this is going on, now we see the tactical air force coming into play. Just like the during the Blitzkrieg, the Germans um, used, and I mean, and they didn't invent it because basically what you see in the Second World War is all the concepts, the operational concepts and, and tactical doctrine that was developed in the First World War being employed with vastly more efficient weapon systems and training and and a, a procedure, a doctrine that that so everybody knows what how to how to do this. In the First World War, you had you had fighter bombers, saw up with camels and things like that, strafing uh, enemy positions behind the line, dropping occasional bombs, things like that. Okay, now in the Second World War, we've got uh, Hurricane Mark fours, Mark three and fours, with 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 four twenty millimeter cannons and bombs. The Hurricane, by that time, not not the best frontline fighter, but certainly a very rugged airplane and a very effective ground attack airplane. Um, you've got the Hawker Typhoon, which is the sort of like the son of Hurricane, and those things are absolutely amazing. It's got a it's got a Napier Saber engine in it, a little problematic at first, but it's a 24 cylinder engine. Basically, take uh, two Merlin engines like what you have in a in a uh, um, in a Spitfire or a Hurricane, and you 
cut the crankshaft in half and you put them all together there. So you've got basically two, uh, two banks of, of 12 cylinder engines there. So you've got like over 3000 horsepower with the, with the superchargers able to loft an, uh, an ungodly amount of firepower, including uh, two inch and, and four inch rockets, as well as bombs, as well as 420 millimeter cannons with a lot of ammunition. Uh, one squadron of typhoons would have the have the broadside effect of a heavy cruiser. So they had a lot of a lot of this firepower. And the, the best thing is you've got radio communications and a system in place between the ground guys and the air and the ships out in the, out at sea. Everybody has their buddies. And so the forward observing officer, when he when he's going forward with the troops, runs into a an enemy entrenched position, got machine guns or an artillery piece, and it's starting to chew up and it stopped them. Okay, you call in a destroyer and you know your destroyer because you know these guys. You've you've, you've been working with them and training with them for in the in the lead up to this. You know the ship that you're dealing with, you know, and they know you. Uh, so the units were were sort of teamed up with each other. And you call in support, and that support comes in. And a lot of these destroyers were actually getting really close to the shore. Like there were a few of them that that uh, almost grounded because they were get because they wanted to get in close enough to make sure that they're laying in as much fire as possible. When you get in that close, not only do you have your main guns off of the destroyer, but destroyers also have a lot of anti-aircraft weapons, which are also very effective in an anti-personnel shore bombardment effect. So a 40 millimeter Bofors, which is an automatic 40 millimeter gun, fires shells about that long um, and about, well, 40 millimeters in diameter, high explosive uh, and, and self-destroying tracer um, and a range out to about 4,000 4, yards, easy. And they, they're firing those things, one, one mount, like at one single gun will fire maybe about... Uh, 25 rounds a, 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 a minute. If And so you've got these quad mounts of these things there. Uh, 20 millimeter cannons. So you're just changing the, the, the boxes on them. And because they're shipborne, you can have water-cooled systems as well. So there's a whole pile of, of, uh, of naval ordnance that is going over the heads of these guys who are, who are coming in through the beach there and keeping the Germans in place while they're, while they're, uh, while they're advancing. Once they are inshore and they're out of range of the, of the ships, that's where the tactical air force came in. You've seen pictures of these aircraft if you get a chance, um, and you'll know the they've got what they call invasion stripes on them because airplanes like when you're when you're when you're a soldier on the ground, you see an airplane, you generally assume that it's probably not going to be friendly, so they have tendency to shoot at them. So what they did for all the Allied aircraft is they put white and black stripes on the bottom of them, so everybody knew whose side they were on. At that point, they weren't worried about stealth, they weren't worried about hiding from the enemy, they were there to lay a beaten on. So they wanted to make sure that they didn't have blue on blue uh, firing instance or, or what they call friendly fire. It ain't friendly, but it's blue on blue situation. So you've got these aircraft that are coming in. Now, these aircraft are also being vectored and directed by either guys on the ground or guys in smaller airplanes who are orbiting around. Um, the, the little uh, uh, Taylor Craft Oster with a, with a straight six little uh, uh, Gypsy Major engine in it was a was a. Uh, a what they call a stool airplane it was short takeoff and landing so it's it's a nice little plane my dad actually rebuilt one when i was a kid and, and uh, i think it's where the heck is it now it's i think it's down in in uh, titusville anyways so they so they've got uh, they've got a, a pilot who's flying around and they've got an observer who is who is directing and coordinating the air assets so basically you've got air traffic control over the zone here so that while when when one when one uh, formation is coming in to to lay waste on a target, other formations are circling up above there, waiting to be vectored in to do it. And they're coming in from different directions. They've got their doctrine down so that the enemy doesn't know where they're coming from, so they can't. So not flying into it. Defenses like when, especially with aircraft, is non-linear. Um, the more airplanes you have around that are attacking from different directions, the the way more hard it makes the uh, defense. Uh, a, a, a solution to to uh, to target them coming in. You get overwhelmed very quickly, so that's what they're doing, and that was from pre-dawn to after sunset on the first day. Now, what is the? I guess I'm I'm I've been babbling along here for a while, so I'm just gonna I'll, I'll just just go on here and I'll I'll give you the 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 prologue. I guess the D Day was. As I guess to quote Churchill, it wasn't the end of the beginning, it wasn't the end, but it was certainly the beginning of the end. What D-Day did was it it uh, 
it ruptured the German ability to control their, um, their territory. From the time of June 1944, the war only lasted another 10 months. Could have been a little bit quicker if there were mistakes that were still made, uh, Market Garden being a major one, where they tried to do too much too fast and they got overconfident. But because of D-Day, the German, uh, everybody who actually was paying attention or actually understood anything about, oh, Hello. Hi there. Can you okay, hear cool. us? Yeah. I don't know why. No, no, it's Q, Hugh, 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 okay. stop for a second. Stop the, uh, for a second. Stop for a second. By the, by the end of, by the, end of, uh, of the, the Normandy operation, the German army was functionally in the West, was functionally destroyed and annihilated. It was a fraction of its, of its former self, and it was never able to again uh, maintain a strategic initiative. What they did at the Battle of the Bulge was shorten the war because it was a last ditch and it was pointless. By the end of the Normandy operation, by the end of the Norman summer, by, by August 1944, German, every German officer, every German soldier, anybody who actually had a wit about them knew that they were screwed, that it was over, it was done, and there was nothing left to do except to surrender. The fact that they didn't was because they were being led by a bunch of methed out fanatics. But the, uh, but the, the, that, so if there's, if, if D-Day has, has, has any, major value and it does is it's the it's the strategic effect it had on absolutely splitting and dividing the german ability to defend their homeland after the landing they had they they were on the they were on the strategic defensive and retreat all the way back to to germany the russians at this point with uh, bagration operation bagration had kicked their butts out of uh, a lot of russia proper they're moving them back right through rolling them back through the ukraine and inflicting millions of casualties on them i mean it's it's what happened on the west on the eastern front um, is is absolutely worth its 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 own story um, there's a really good book done by uh, an american officer right after the second world war who is a fluent German speaker, and he, he interviewed uh, a lot of the German senior officers. Yes. Hello. Yep. Oh, okay. You can hear me now. Awesome. Okay, can you hear me now? Awesome. Okay. We could hear you the whole time. That wasn't the problem. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. You can't hear us. <laughs> I can hear you now. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll make it quick and I'll wrap it up then. Okay. No, the, thing no, no. Is with, the thing is with it, it's, oh this was the Malachi crunch that slammed the Germans. How's that? <laughs> okay. Did I screw everything uh, up? No, 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 no. It's just that we couldn't ask you questions. Oh, I'm so sorry. So you were saying things, and we were trying to intervene to get more details about oh, certain okay, things sorry. that you would just, so we we couldn't, it just, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, so um, it was a, a logistical, uh, one of the greatest logistical endeavors in human history, and Canada um, did very well um, because... Um, we very much punched above our weight in this uh, in these events. Um, so we we had the landing and we got behind the, the defenses and all that kind of stuff. Um, why? I, I want to get get the, get the kids in a, a sense of why it was important to do this and why this day was seminal or you know, very, very, very special, even like transformative in Canadian history and how Canada was perceived on the world stage before and after this. Putting it in that context, this was the first war that Canada fought as an independent country. Uh, during the First World War, we were, when, when Britain went to war, we went to war automatically. In this mm -hmm. war, we picked, we, we chose, we declared war on Germany and we went to war as an independent country. By the end of this war, Canada had the third largest navy on earth, behind the British and the Americans. We were 
we were the theater commanders of the entire Atlantic. We were in charge of all the submarine, anti-submarine operations. Um, and we killed, destroyed about 75% of the entire U-boat fleet. We had an army of professionals. The Norman Summer, as it's called, was where the British and the Canadians secured the, the uh, took the brunt of the, of the German attacks and destroyed them in place while the Americans launched Operation Cobra to the south and basically gave them a right hook around and they rolled them all up. We almost completely destroyed them at the, at the uh, Falaise Pocket. There were some issues there and some of them escaped, but it didn't really make much difference except it just might have lengthened the war by a month or so. Mm -hmm. The At the end of this war, Canada wasn't just a junior partner in an alliance. We were an independent country with a mm -hmm. with a reputation and we were seen on the world stage as being equal in every way possible, not size, but, but certainly uh, politically and morally to the United States, to Britain, to other countries that, that were involved. We were part of the, finally, we were part of the, part of the, uh, the, the family of nations as it were. So we because got invited to the big, Canadian, big, big, big players table. Because of the, of our participation and the sacrifices that, uh, that the nation made in the second world war, the United Nations came about. That was, that would not have happened without Canadian involvement. Mm -hmm. um, Pearson, for example, peacekeeping, the idea that that uh, that collective defense is the best way to prevent wars in the future. Without the Canadian involvement in the Second World War, would we have had a Third World War? Maybe, possibly. I don't know. Mm. That's that's just that's what if thing. So you can't really do that in history. Right. But we certainly we certainly played uh, punched above our weight uh, during the conflict and certainly afterwards. My mm -hmm. my fear that we're we're kind of been been resting on our laurels for too long, and we need to actually boost yeah. that up a bit, especially given climate change and what's happening in our Arctic. It's time yeah. to start getting serious about defense again. We can no longer, like in the 1930s, it was said that Canada is a uh, um, is um, uh, inflammable materials in, in a in a fireproof house, far from danger. We're we're not like that. We, we if that wasn't true at the time, and it's certainly not true now. Yeah, um, our interests are completely interlocked and intertwined with the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We learned a lot of those lessons on the beaches of Normandy. Hmm. All right. So Canada pu punched above its weight. It gained respect internationally. It was sort of our, um, for lack of a better term, coming out party. Uh, mm -hmm. in terms of being a player on the world stage, uh, a lot was asked of us and we did a lot. Uh, I think I remember reading somewhere that, uh, um, uh, relative to, uh, proportionally to the size, uh, I don't know what you call them, uh, the Canadian war or effort battalions was... or whatnot. Yeah, the size of the war effort, uh, Canadians probably took the biggest hit. Um, we we certainly had, we had, we didn't take a, in in terms of overall casualties or, or percentage of casualties. No, we did we did certainly uh, yeah proportionally we, speaking proportionally yeah 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 the by far the I mean the Russians well nobody's really sure how many millions of people they That's lost true. it was it was well over twelve million people uh, both military Jeez. and civilian, um, but we certainly yeah we we uh, we our casualties weren't as weren't as heavy as they were during the first World War. Okay. Um, because we did better planning and we, we had a, we had a different philosophy in order to avoid becoming cannon fodder. We turned our military into, into us uh, and our, our national war effort into not just a military war effort, but also a logistical and training exercise. Um, I didn't mention the British Commonwealth air training plan, which allowed bomber command and allowed all these aircraft to, to actually be used as effectively as they did. But everywhere across the country in, in Canada, um, there were there were air bases that were constructed and people from all over the world, Americans, Commonwealth, Canadians, New Zealanders, Australians, would come here and would learn how to fly and would trained how to operate as a, as a, as a strategic and a tactical air force. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think I live near one. Oh, yeah, you do. 
You do. Yeah. You you live near about three of them, actually. Yeah. There's the, there's two down in, well, there's Trenton, of course. There's one down at uh, Mountain View in the county. Um, there's one over, it's called well, Mohawk, but it's down by uh, Deserando there in, in Tyendinaga. Um, mm -hmm. they're, they're scattered all over the country. But but um, close to where Emily, I live. Uh, Emily was close to where well. I live. Yeah, but close to where I live in Kingston specifically, yeah, I heard that uh, uh, like, like right close to my house, there was a landing strip originally. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, actually, yeah, you're you're in the north end there. Yeah, yes, yeah. there was. They uh, and and so all these all these these training locations, the the air forces as well. They they uh, rotate all their 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 flight crews, so their combat crews through it. Rather than like the the Japanese had this problem during the Second World War, they would put their their pilots who at the beginning of the war were probably the best in the world um, mm -hmm. into their combat formations until they died, and then mm. they didn't have them anymore. What the Americans and the Canadians and the British did was they made sure that when after after a certain percentage of time, they would take some of their best operators out of the squadrons and send them back. Like my uncle Laurie did this and give them a, a training base so that they could be in charge of ensuring that the that the new lessons that are learning. Because remember, war is always an evolution of everything um, like mm -hmm. the defense changes. So the offense has to change all the way through. Right. So the most recent lessons learned are being are being taught to the to the people were coming into the four. That's why we were able to, to uh, by 1944, 1945, absolutely devastate the Luftwaffe. Um, they were still able to put up some planes and they're still able to make planes, but they didn't have any pilots left at the end of the war enough to do, to do the job. Gotcha. And frankly, their their aircraft, like everybody talks about, ooh, the wonder weapons and things like that, all that did was was dilute their resources away from things which would actually have have helped their war effort more. I mean, people look at the Bismarck and say, wow, what a beautiful ship. That's great. I'm like, well, Bismarck interprets. They could have made 25 subs each for the, for the amount of metal and, and uh, construction that went into those ships. It was a vanity project. Nazis okay. were all about flash. And, and the look, they were not about the, about the structure, the logistics, the training, the, mm. the boring stuff that actually wins wars. If that was one thing that, that Canada did really well, it's that we figured out how to build a system to create victory and the conditions for victory. Mm -hmm. So the, the Germans looked fierce um, and, and looked scary, especially with the uniforms because those... Uh, those they uniforms were something. Well, boss made good uniforms. I mean, gotta, you got to give them credit where it's due there. I mean, silver piping <laughs> on black looks pretty cool, but. Yeah, 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 I know. Yeah, that was, uh, but yeah, that, it's see, that's really funny. That's an aspect I, I, I did not know that, um, that really, for all intents and purposes, logistics won the day here. Yeah, and that then that if there's if there's a lesson to be learned in in the study of war, that that's it. It's that um, it, it, weapon systems and uh, don't win wars, and, and individual courage does not win a war. You need that, but D Day was won by the people who figured out how to load the ships, how to get everything aboard, so that. It would be getting off the ship at the right time, in the right place, in the right quantity, to the right people. Leadership and and bravery were the guys who got the soldiers to get off the landing ships and go into combat. Couldn't mm -hmm. have done that one without the other. It doesn't work. But without right. that support, without that basis, bravery is pointless. Japan's problem hmm. right there. What did they well, do? Because by the it's end the fine line between bravery and stupidity, bravery. right? Yep. Massive amounts of bravery, but no... Uh, ability to back it up with with the with the supplies and the and the resources. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Um, so we're eighty years later now, and there are ceremonies and there are things going on. I think most of the ceremonies are actually done for the day over there. Yeah. Um, why? I want to put. Uh, I saw some troll on Twitter. Like this, and uh, the only reason I'm mentioning the troll is to be able to bring the question. Yeah. Um, complaining. Uh, why is the prime minister still there? The ceremony only lasts three, four hours, like this, and then you know it's like he could come back, you know, because of the whole news that just exploded with regard to uh, foreign interference. So mm -hmm. the the whole place, you know, it's a dumpster fire here, and he's going over there. It's like it's the job. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Why points. is it? And why is it important for for the, the the people that happen to be hate watching us like this, and that are going to complain about you know the carbon that he used, and he should be here instead because you know we just found out this news. Why is it important for our prime minister to be, regardless of stripe, regardless of whether you like him or her or not or them or not? Why is it important for us to actually be there on these commemoration days? Well, the Prime Minister is there doing two things. He's representing Canada in probably one of the most uh, most important military um, ceremonies, memorial ceremonies in the last 25 years. He's also there with, uh, there will be, there are Canadian veterans who are, who are they're, they're getting very old now, but there's, the, who made that trip and that pilgrimage back to, back to that place. He's there because and for any trolls who are who are complaining about this, they might want to remember that they have this ability to complain because of what those people did. Thank you. Thank That's you. That's where it is. The uh, yeah. we would not we would not be living in the world we're living in, good, bad, or indifferent, but certainly a hell of a lot better than it would have been without the absolute determination and sacrifice of hundreds of thousands of Canadians men and women who gave their all either either here working in factories and there are a lot of and and building the weapons of war or training people or going overseas or in the merchant marine to who are taking all this equipment and people across the atlantic day after day after day risking their lives the soldiers who walked across the beaches into into frigging machine gun fire to to uh, uh take these positions and end the war as quickly as they can we we stand on the shoulders of giants and I think it's right and proper that we that we memorialize that and respect that. Mm -hmm. Yep, I agree with you. Uh, now, the prime minister was going to be going to attending two services. Uh, the first one, of course, mm -hmm. uh, for for Canadian, but then he was going to go uh, also to attend uh, the ceremony uh, for the landing at Omaha mm -hmm. uh, Beach as well. Um, can you tell us, I know we weren't involved in that one, right? Because that was the Americans, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we, why, why, would our, why would our Prime Minister go to that ceremony as well? Well, first off, you've got to remember that the, the, at, at this stage of the war, even though the, the, the Juno sector was, was the Canadian beach, Canadians were involved all the way across. Uh, as were Americans, as were British. It was, a, it was a, an integrated allied operation. Uh, there were Canadians on, on the beach at, at, at all five. There were Canadians supplying air cover, supplying uh, um, um, fire support from the sea at all five beaches. It wasn't, it wasn't just, uh, we're over here, you're over there sort of thing. So there, so there was a Canadian involvement across the board. But also, I mean, these are our allies. Um, this, the, the United States at this time in the Second World War had was the was the 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 most powerful nation on earth it, it's it's sort of change, things change I and mean, maybe it's not there now of course but um but it's it's uh it's participation in the in the second world war uh cannot be underestimated um it's it's i think it's important for our prime minister to be there to to uh, respect and honor those sacrifices as well just as the americans are at juno to uh respect and honor our sacrifices Right. It was a, it was war. It was a team effort. We're all we were all in it together. So mm -hmm. that'd be mm -hmm. my answer. Yeah. Uh, now another thing I had heard because I was listening to a couple of things was that on D Day, when D Day had come around, because the Americans have their version of you know mm -hmm. they won the war, um, which we know that's not exactly the it wouldn't have been won without them, but they. They didn't win it <laughs> for years. They, they kind of arrived in a little late. Um, but at that point, it was more the British that were the biggest group there, not the Americans. Is that correct? Not quite, actually. By this point in the war, the, okay. the Britain was was a declining power. The, okay. uh, the Second World War was the swan song of the British Empire. They, they realized well it was by by the Suez crisis they realized that they were no longer a, a major power and they had to they had to change their policies but the uh 
the um, understand also like while this is going on in Europe and while this massive huge invasion is happening in Europe at about the same time, I think about a week after this, was it uh, Peleliu? I think there was there was an American uh, uh, naval operation um, attacking about the same size that attacked over three thousand miles out of out of Pearl Harbor and several other places to take out uh, several islands in in the Pacific in a chain. Um, so the Americans at this point are the preeminent power on the planet. Uh, the big blue fleet out in the out in the Pacific is is massive like we're talking by this point in the war they have i think over a dozen aircraft carriers heavy carriers not to mention several dozen uh light carriers um they've got more cruisers by one point in the in the uh in 1944 late 1944 the the american uh naval aviation in the pacific had or naval navy in the pacific had more destroyers than the or than the japanese did aircraft okay uh, so the the amount of production that America is able to do is absolutely phenomenal. Their their participation in the war, both in both in terms of of, uh, of of direct combat as well as the as well as the supply supplies and the weapons and and the and the logistics and the oil too, because they're also the major oil power on the planet as well, um, cannot be cannot be underestimated. The Russian advance through Bagration all the way to the gates of uh, of Berlin. Well, most of those guys were riding on the in the beds of uh, Studebaker trucks. So there's there's a tremendous amount of uh, of American involvement throughout the world. So, you know, and and yeah, they they were slow getting into it in the in the Second World War. <coughs> Pardon me. And as a as a as a Canadian, I get a little jingoistic sometimes. I think that they 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 do tend to toot their own horn a little too much. <laughs> Many of their stories that they that they tell in their in their movies um, are borrowed. Well, you say that kindly from uh, other incidents that happened uh, around the world, like uh, what was that U five seven one or whatever that movie was, but where they captured the documents on. Well, okay, you know, yeah, Canadians did that. It was yeah. a, and actually the the one Canadian who did that. He was naked when he did it, except for his sea boots, because he lost all his clothes swimming across the submarine to keep the hatch open with a handgun, so that they couldn't submerge, so they couldn't uh, couldn't uh, sink the sub, and they were able to get the Enigma codes. With the Enigma codes, they were able to read all the German codes. They could tell where the German subs were. So that meant that they could route their convoys around them. I mean, okay. Wars are, this is, this is a fantastically complex undertaking. Um, and uh, it's, I don't know, as a historian, I, I just, it, like, it's, 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 a, it's a brilliant seven-year period that more, ha like, sometimes, what is it they say? Like, like sometimes uh, it, it takes, uh, it takes years for something to happen sometimes years happen in a second that this is one of those compressed time frames we start the second world war basically like we had the first we ended the first world war same weapons number one mark three mm. fields um lewis guns um biplanes we end the war with nuclear weapons and jet fighters and radar and yeah. advanced and advanced uh, uh, uh communications um, it's it, the 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 spectacular growth in in technological advancement throughout these seven years is is another wonderful story that needs to be shared as well, and and D Day is is certainly as part of that with the with the uh, ability to to coordinate and communicate um, that that really and, and and like just going back to the Norman Summer for a second the operational ingenuity that that people were were coming up with like Guy Simmons in his command Guy Simmons was one of our finest uh combat officers um Montgomery thought he was he was way better than Harry Crear in fact when Harry got sick um he took over from he took over one can one first Canadian army from Harry okay um operation totalized and tractable he came up with something called artificial moonlight where they use massive huge anti-air like the the uh, um, um, spotlights pointed up at the at the cloud base to illuminate the cloud base like you know how cities look like at night so you can actually right. see what's going on so that soldiers could move forward and do night attacks I mean they I mean this was the sort of ingenious planning that these guys were coming up with it's really interesting Jeez. wow so much you never hear. That's so cool. <laughs> wow. I, I didn't think that we would be talking about someone swimming naked and creating artificial moonlight. Well, it's kind it's of amazing. scary. I guess if you're looking up out of the hatch of your U-boat and there's a naked guy with a Webley revolver standing there pointing it at you, you're like, yeah, what did we walk into? 
<laughs> there's, there's, there's an inappropriate joke there, but I won't make it because we're talking about D-Day. <laughs> Save that for later. So, something involving being happy to see me. <laughs> I just, just, so that, well, it was in North Atlantic, so I'm sure that I'm sure that he might have been a little, just a little bit short. But. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. <laughs> and we've gone off the rails, kids. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, <laughs> I was not expecting that. <laughs> well played, sir. Uh, I, um, so, um, for Canadians, um, how would I put it? Newer Canadians to Canada. Um, who may uh, not have, uh, well, may not, who, who don't have a family here unless they married into it, uh, that have a military past associated with Canada. Um, why is it important uh, for them to know this part of Canada's history? Well, if I would, I would, I would say that, like, if you're looking at at, at different ethnicities, um, there there vir were virtually every ethnicity that is here in Canada today uh, served during the Second World War. Um, mm. I think I think of I think of, for example, Curb Lake, for example, the the uh, uh, Anishinaabe community just near here. Literally every person of of age to volunteer for the military volunteered for the military out of that community. They had to give up their they had to give up their status in order to do that. Um, yeah. I mean, Canadians have have like we've had we've had uh, um, people like like um, you know, even in the First World War. I mean, Lester Pearson he, he was a he was an he was a pilot in he was an he, had, he was a pilot in a in a I think it was a reconnaissance observation plane in the First World War. His back seater was Sikh. So let's and so so we've we've always we've always these people have always been part of our of our story and part of our national history. Um, and I think that one of the things that we don't do a very good job at is recognizing that. Same thing with same thing like like I, on on Twitter who are like, oh, oh military is getting so woke and all these it's going to make it all these gay people are going to make it all horrible. Oh well, LGBTQ2S people have been always been part of our military. Some of the bravest right. and and uh, most brilliant people I've served with were were of that community. I mean, it, it, these, these, a nation is, a nation's military is always a reflection of its entire society, good, bad, and indifferent. It's always going to be there. You're going to get some rednecks in there. You're going to get some, some real lefties in there. You're going to get people from a variety of backgrounds. If we, if we say, well, this was a white war, well, that's not being truthful either, because there were tremendous numbers of, of uh, Canadians of color who, who, who participated in the second world war. Um, we have we also have the burden of shame to bear with the way that we treated our Japanese Canadians. We did the exact same thing in turning them as the Americans did. David Suzuki, yeah. for example, had to spend time in a bloody camp. Right. Um, so so warts and all, I mean, this is part of our heritage, this is part of our history. And they're always history like doesn't rhyme, but it or it doesn't repeat, but it does rhyme. Mm -hmm. There are always lessons that we can draw from the past about how we we reacted to these situations so we can apply those to the future. Mm -hmm. Times change. People don't. We've got the same brains as we did 10,000 years ago. So right. people's reactions, people's emotions, people's uh, way that they that they that they process information never really changes. Certain circumstances change, but we can always learn from the past. And I think it's I think it's important for that. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. I, uh, I, I concur there. Um, when you mentioned Indigenous soldiers, and there's something uh, that made, it made me think of something, because I had heard on the news two days ago uh, that the Indigenous soldiers, and I didn't know that they had to give up their status, I learned that today, um, were promised things if they served, and when they got back, they didn't necessarily get it. I believe farmland and stuff of the sort. Mm -hmm. 
Could you speak a little bit to that? Uh, could you? They they were yeah there there were there were certain there were certain uh, promises that were made because uh, it was they just like in the first world war they were they were seen as being natural soldiers and um, and as being like people that the that the military really wanted to have in the ranks and they certainly did did serve quite honorably and quite well across the board in all services. Um, but Canada, I mean, like we, we have a, we've got a fairly significant problem with, with our, with our racial history. And in, in fact, during the second world war, we also had some problems with just even with, with, uh, French as well as English for heaven's sakes. I mean, there, there were in 1944, 1945, there were riots over, over, uh, conscription, mm -hmm. conscription riots. In, in Quebec, which damn near split the country. Mackenzie King did his best to try to hold that together by, by, and I, I think he probably did as well as he could with that, with that situation. Was he the um, one that said conscription if necessary, but not necessarily conscription? Yeah. Yeah. He tried, he okay. tried, he tried to thread that needle. Um, and, and all he did was wound up ticking everybody off. The, the conscripted soldiers who came up were, were, uh, were told that they would be conscripted in the national service, but they weren't going to be allowed to deploy over, they wouldn't have to deploy overseas. So they were called zombies because they look like soldiers, they walk like soldiers, but they're not doing the same thing as soldiers. And to be quite honest, most of the Canadians overseas didn't want conscripts in their, in their formations anyway, because they saw them as a, as a uh, danger and a liability. You don't want somebody, if you're in a very dangerous position, you don't want somebody beside you who you can't trust or who you don't think might might or might not have your back when when the chips are down so there were there were some issues of that uh with respect to with respect to first nations i mean it's, it's the same with a lot of i would say they they suffered the same way they suffered before the war and the same way they, they've been suffering all the way up to today with grassy narrows and things like that and what's happening down in sarnia we still don't treat them very well and we're not honoring our treaties with them um the uh um Black Canadians, the same way. Um, Halifax, Africaville, um, the, the was raised in order to build a goddamn park and a bridge at the north end of the or at the south end of the Bedford Basin, mm -hmm. and people were kicked out, and an entire community was was destroyed and removed. Why? Well, they're black. Nobody really cared about that. The, um, the, the we've yeah, I mean we, we've got we've got we've got some some uh, some serious baggage with the way that we treat we, we treat. Uh, uh, people of color. We also have some serious baggage the way we treat veterans, period. Um, yep. For example, it was only very recently that merchant marine sailors were, were even given a fraction of the, of the uh, um, respect and, uh, and support that they had due based on their service in the, in the, in the second world war. Mm -hmm. A ship, a warship can fight back. A warship has tools and training and crews and knows what to do. A merchant ship is moving along at sometimes five knots in a straight line. These guys are doing that back and forth every day for five, seven years. A lot of them had ships, had several ships shot out under them. And they survived. And they got back aboard when they got into harbor. They lost pay when the ship went down because their pay usually stopped when the ship sank. And then they had to then they had to uh, um, re-enroll re and, and sign up on another ship. And they did that for, for, for an entire war. We didn't even consider them veterans until recently. So I mean, it's it's a we we've, we've yeah, veterans affairs has has some splaining to do, but <laughs> jeez. Um so let, let's bring this now to today. Um, 80 years has gone by. Mm -hmm. um, are there lessons from that era, that time, that day um, that are important to retain and could be useful now considering what we're going on in the world, going on in the world right now? Because this D-Day here is different. Um, mm -hmm because um, it's a big, well, it's 80th anniversary. It's a big ceremony. That's one. Um, but it is happening uh, while um, one of our former allies at the time, I guess, Russia, um, is now at war with one of our current allies, Ukraine. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Volodymyr Zelensky uh, was attending the ceremonies as well. Um, 
it's how do you put it? Like Russia recently had Victory Day, and there were um, people from nations uh, that had been involved on the Allied side at the time that did not attend. Mm-hmm. Now, um, so so things are different. It's not uh, it's not one big happy family anymore, or at least a family that agrees to. Know, not to talk about that issue at Thanksgiving when we get together <laughs> because Uncle Ron will go off. Um, so given that we are in a situation of war and a lot of people are saying that we basically already are in World War III, we just, you know, a lot of people haven't acknowledged it yet. Mm-hmm. Um, how, is, how is this particular D-Day uh, significant and uh, and how could we look to those events to maybe help us get through the current moment? I would I would say that that uh, the 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 lessons that we that we had in that we learned at, at D Day. First off, this is the, let's face it. This is essentially this is the last uh, anniversary of D Day where we're going to have participation with with people who are actually there. So this we're at one of these sort of bitter, sad inflection points where it is passing from the era of lived experience into the realm of history, just like Vimy Ridge is. Um, it's the the uh, so so that that all by itself, I think it's important that we that we commemorate it and honor it while we still have some people here to to thank in the flesh. The lessons that we learned during that conflict was that national pride or expansion or jingoism is is unacceptable the war gave us and the the effort against uh, against fascism gave us the understanding that that people are very important more important than governments more important than systems more important than 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 territorial expansion we learned that the best way to secure those those freedoms that we care about, that we find that we believe are, are important, Chart of Rights and Freedoms enshrines them for us, is through, we have to defend them, we have to do it collectively. No nation can stand alone anymore. That's The world doesn't work that way. We are all inter- interconnected and we are all linked. Um, what happens to one country affects all countries. So right. if you've got a situation where one country is is invading another country, well, that becomes everybody's problem, for a variety of reasons. We need to mm-hmm. we need to we need to remember what unites us and what we what we did together and what we could achieve by working together. Um, we stopped the most brutal conflict in recorded history together. No nation did that alone. Nations participated as best they could. Some of them did more, some of them did less. But the Poles were fighting alongside Canadians and one Canadian uh, army. The Poles were also, they also had destroyers at work. The Free French were there. The Free French landed on their own at, 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 uh, well, I think in the American sector, but they landed their own, their own forces on, on Normandy as well. Um, People from around the world, Indians, um, we're, we're fighting not as much in 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 uh, um, Europe because they were they're mostly fighting under Sim and with Sim and the British and Commonwealth forces and American forces in in uh, in the Pacific, but the Australians everybody this was a global global effort to stop a pervasive evil um, that everybody knew this was this like and for once I guess for a very brief time the world was united in a common cause. Mm-hmm. That's something. Since- to yeah, since since you mentioned it, um, because we can't talk about World War Two about without talking about the common cause, and there are also relation links to today. Um, six million, at least six million Jews were exterminated in camps, and uh, right now we are uh, probably witnessing in Canada and other countries in the world the. Um, most insidious and um, fervent, for lack of a better word, uh, rise of uh, anti-Jew hate mm-hmm. in a good long while, probably since 
the war. Yeah. Um, and we also have a generation of people now uh, whose parents or grandparents may not have fought in these wars. So the Holocaust, like, my mom was born in 1939. So yeah, she was a child during the war and that type of stuff and probably doesn't remember much because she was young at that point. But my older aunts and uncles would be able to tell me a little bit, right? I'm just, I'm one generation removed. Mm -hmm. But when you start becoming two or three generations removed, um, it seems that there's a lot of people that are not as aware of the history of the Holocaust and may not be aware of why it is the world said um, never again at the point because we're watching this rise again. Um, are there any lessons with regard uh, to that period and what we're uh, commemorating today that we should be taking into the current political moment when it comes uh, to standing up for our Jewish brothers and sisters. Now that now that and and I, I I get your point. Now that it is passing out the the even the Holocaust is sort of passing out from the from the realm of lived experience, like I said, into 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 the realm of history. Well, that makes that makes it just that much more important to be taught uh, and to be an integral to our to our education to our public education system. The only way that you can confront hatred and bigotry and prejudice is through understanding. We had, we like the Second World War, um, it wasn't until, like people knew that there were problems, like it, it, but it wasn't until the, the camps started to be liberated uh, that people really, really understood the overwhelming um, evil that had, that had happened. Um, and I think in the last year of the war, that's when that started to take place. After after uh, the, the 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 Russians first started to to enter the the German controlled areas in Poland and places like that, when the Canadians and the Americans and the and the French and the British entered into southern France, where there were a few few uh, camps, and then certainly into Germany, where they started to liberate these camps. That's when the then when the true evil import of what happened came through. We built an entire system of of, uh, of of legal jurisprudence based on on the shock and horror of, of what we witnessed. the The idea that nations cannot be excused from from doing this to each other, that people in power are responsible for their actions, that as an officer, as a soldier, you are responsible for your actions. That's some there, there's no there's there's well, there, there can be no collective punishment, but there also has to be specific punishment. Not right. every not everybody in Germany was was anti-Semitic. Some of, there were a lot of a lot of uh, right. German communists, a lot of German Jews, a lot of uh, uh, German homosexuals, people like that were in were in the were were uh, in these camps as well. Yeah. So the the hate is 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 prevalent. Oh no, it's that's a that's a tough one. We we you're right. We're seeing rise. And it's it's we see a lot of of anti-Semitism, and anti-Semitism as well as as anti-Muslim sentiment as right. well. Um, it's it's ugly. It's and it is pervasive. The the idea of the Holocaust, like even on even on Twitter, there are people who are openly expressing their their uh, affection for 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 fascism and nazi ideals right i mean as a as a as a as a vet and as a as a history teacher i fully i fully support their their right to be a complete jerk and and say stupid things like that but it but it shows me is that yeah you're right uh we we are we are losing the the plot here uh to a certain extent with the message itself is is getting diluted and is getting um blunted through time um, and distance from the actual events. I don't know what to do other than say as a history teacher, it's our job and our duty as educators to ensure that uh, future generations understand these lessons. I mean, I wasn't born during the Second World War, of course. I mean, we're same similar age. I mean, I was born in 1970. Um, 
so so the so for me though i mean let's face it i mean it's still i was born like less than 25 years after the second world war so it really right. isn't that long ago from from my perspective mind you my kids are are even farther removed from that and their kids will be even farther removed from that uh, the Second World War to my grandchildren will probably be of less relevance to them than, say, the First World War is to me. Right. So these are that's why as it passes into history, that's why I think it's important for us as a as a as a society to ensure that we enshrine these lessons in in our curriculum and uh, in our in our in our our social structures. So that we so that we we pass on the the, the basic message. You're going to have to like history. History is 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 both is both um, the logical um, progression of certain ideas and facts, and X le leads to Y leads to Z. But it's also emotional, as as anything. It is personal. It is visceral, and it is a very emotional experience. I don't know how to how to capture that and and keep that alive, except through uh, doing our best to. Uh, ensure that we we do uh, recorded living history with the people who are still left who who right. uh, who um, uh, endured these events or experienced these events and maintain their perspective and make sure that we teach that as best we can. Okay, just one second. Now, kids, let me know. <laughs> Paul just sent me a message saying that I oh. needed to unplug my mic and try it again. Okay. And I saw that Kit Michael had said that uh, my sound had gotten a little wonky there for a bit. Um, one final question, I guess, and this one's more of a personal one. Um, why do you love history so much, and in particular military history? That's a good question. I grew up. I grew up in a in a uh, a family where I was exposed at a very early age to uh, a wide variety of of Canadian experiences that were really profound and unique. I mean, my grandfather um, was was a was a was a uh, an old school bush pilot, and I, I he he also taught me how to garden too. But I, I right. learned from him. Um, a love of of country and a love of 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 and, and an interest in, in what he did and what he experienced when i was a small kid in uh, lakefield my my uh, grandmother's uh, backyard neighbor was a veteran of the first world war and uh he explained to me some of his some of his experiences at lived experience at in in uh, bimmy ridge and uh, 100 days, actually, because he started at Vimy and he, he fought through, I think it was at Cambria, he got shot and he got returned home. Um, I don't know. I, I've, I've always had, a, I've always had a, probably because I was just, I find, I find our history fascinating. People think Canadian history is boring, but I, I think that's because they are not looking at it the right way. History is the story of, of how we got to the point we're at. It's, it's navigating. It's, it's navigating the human experience. Um, I, I learned, I, 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 I became uh, um, fascinated by military history when I was in grade nine, and I had to do summer school down at Thomas A. Stewart in Peterborough for math, and I, I was there early, so I'd spend time in the library reading books on the Boer War. I just okay. because I found it fascinating. Um, it's as a as a as a professional officer when I was in the Navy. Also, um, the military uses history not just as a as a uh, a way of of ensuring social norms and things like that, but also it's a lessons learned operation because the things that that have happened in the past do influence the way that you process decisions, the way you make decisions, the way you decide how you're going to act in the future. The only way you can do that is by looking back and and seeing how how other people have managed similar situations and learn whatever lessons you can from it. Otherwise, you're just basically repeating everything over and over. Life's far too short to be making the same mistakes repeatedly. It's important mm. to learn from them and and do your best to ensure that, well, you're making different mistakes in the future. Mm. In history as in life. Mm -hmm. Wow. Ah, Kihu, thanks so much. No worries. It was fun. That was brilliant. That was brilliant. 
Um, I, I know that at the beginning, the, for for the kids who might be watching or listening, that uh, you know, there was some tech things going on. Uh, but that, that's not your fault. That's not you. That's not you. Don't don't, don't apologize okay. for that. Was, you provided this content. content. You provided this content. Uh, and uh, we must. Uh, I want to take a moment here to uh, recognize and give a big shout out, and hope the kids too in our audience too, uh, to uh, Mr. Grizzly, uh, who did some of this remotely and uh, did. Uh, basically a yeoman's job um, trying to get us a uh, video and sound coordinated together and kept on improving the sound uh, throughout the show um, because uh, I, I don't know how it is. He manages to do what he does, but I mean, this is what he does for a living and he's a professional. He's an expert and he, he makes it happen because the, today uh, um, we MacGyvered a lot of things to bring this to you. <laughs> um, Kit Hugh, um, I never know what to say because I find that thank you for your service is just a lame sort of throwaway statement. I know that a lot of people really mean it, um, but I don't know what it is. If if you have a preference of what it is that you, or if people in the military have a preference of what it is that they would like people to tell them when they want to thank them for their service. Um, but whatever that is, I am saying it to you. And if you can tell us what it is, we would love to know <laughs> um, something Here's that's more meaningful. Secret. The full secret: I joined yeah. the Navy to pay for university. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think my brother my may have done that too. <laughs> uh, but still. No, I don't, people who serve, in the, especially in the Canadian Forces, because it's all volunteer. If, if somebody wants to thank me for my service, I feel a little, I don't know, I, sometimes I feel a little awkward about it because it's like, for me, I'm like, well, I did it for my own reasons. And I know everybody signs up and does their thing for their own reasons. But if you want to, if you want to thank a vet, Write a letter to Veterans Affairs and tell them to uh, to work on their their pro their processes and support for uh, Canadian veterans. I mean, I'm I'm an old guy here, but I I've, I I actually served in a position where I never was actually in combat. Um, mm -hmm. There are a lot of guys way younger than me who are really really struggling and suffering and hurting hard who need a hell of a lot of support and love. Um, some of the stuff that these poor Poor guys and gals did in 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 Afghanistan and around the world, and the things that they have seen leaves scars that will be with them for the rest of their entire lives. Some of them are not coping well when they get home. They're they're not well treated by the Veterans Affairs, and they have a very difficult time getting the services they need. So, anytime you can advocate for veterans, that's the best way to think of that. All right, and a lot of those scars are not uh, visible. Nope, nope. The worst ones are inside. Yeah. Um, so yeah, um, thank you. Um, if you have a chance to see your dad today, uh, thank him. I will. He's sleeping right now. <laughs> for us, uh, and I do look forward to meeting him and uh, working on that project so we can uh, bring a bit of his story uh, to, to the kits and uh, document it somehow. And uh, thank you for always being willing uh, to come on the show and uh, share your knowledge. I, um, I have. And it, incredible amount of respect um, for all of the content you have in that beautiful brain of yours. Um, and the kits here too. I mean, you, we listen to these tech cause I like to listen to these types of episodes on these days too. And, you know, and learn and see how people analyze it and talk about it. And, um, and we get to detail and we learn interesting things. But when you talk to us about it, you give us down to the barrel sizes, <laughs> right? <laughs> that are that are being used. You have so much detail that we can actually paint a picture in our mind, a full picture. And, and it's not that we can't when other people, historians, are talking about it and when I'm listening on other news. Um, but they're broader brushstrokes and maybe... Uh, you know, uh, you know, five or six basic colors. But what can I say? I'm a history. You paint with you paint with all the colors <laughs> Thank when you, you do it. Uh, and um, so, when we're listening to you, um, it's vivid. I mean, we had some kits in the chat here saying I could listen to him all day. 
Wow. Because you just, your, your passion for it and the, that, that you know so much about it and that you have all these interesting anecdotes like the guy who had to swim naked. You know, it's... That was leading semen. It, it, I'll, I'll it, have it, to remember his name. It was... Yeah. Uh, was it... Was it uh, uh, I want to say Sutcliffe, but I'm not sure. I'll have to, I'll have to look that up. Okay. <laughs> but for... for to me, a sign of a good teacher is someone who can bring the material to life. And whenever we talk uh, about this, and of course other things, but when we talk about this specifically, because when I asked you to talk on the uh, to, uh, asked you on the phone a few days ago if you wanted to do this, uh, we talked for about an hour. Yeah, right, like this, and you just, uh, <laughs> about stuff. And you, you, no, no, but well, exactly. But you were, but you were talking to talk to, and you mentioned it a little bit in the show there. But you were talking about how uh, you know. Uh, the Canadians and the the Polish worked it together, mm. um, and that's, and I never learned that in my history class either. So it's just that you you bring so much. You bring color. You bring texture. You bring uh, you know, like I said, we, we can ima- we can close our eyes and see the movie projected in the back of our eyelids of what's going on when we listen to you talk. And it's um, I I'm the better for it. And uh, I hope that our, our kids and that our audience uh, really appreciate it. I, I know that our kids watching live did because they make it, uh, they make it very clear. But I am sincerely hoping, uh, and yes, of course, it's self-interest. We get a benefit. But I'm hoping that this one is as popular as your last appearance on our show because um, y- you bring it. You just bring it. I was just thinking, if you're if you guys are interested, it'd be interesting to do a retrospective at the end of uh, uh, victory in, in uh, over Japan Day, and looking at the uh, atomic oh. bombing, and the legacy of the atomic bombing, and how that literally shaped our modern world. Yes, when is that? That will be uh, in in when is that? That September. Uh, uh, I'll be this September. It'll be in the fall, anyways. Okay. Or, or next year, it'll be next year in the fall. It's September. Okay. 15th. Yeah. August 45. August 45 is when they dropped the bomb. VJ Day was was I think 3 September. But Okay, well, let's put it on the calendar. Let's do that. I'd be fascinated by that. All right. Awesome. All right. Okay. My friend, I love you. Talk thank to you later. You, you make the later. show better. Oh, thank you. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, how can you not love that man? Seriously, kids. <laughs> Seriously. Au revoir. Uh. <laughs> Uh, okay, I do not know if we have uh, Mr. Grizzly because I know he's at work uh, somewhere, uh, but I'm going to start the extra. And if I need to stretch, don't worry, I will. So, kids and cubs, that's the end of this episode, our very, very, very special episode. I always remember back in the 80s, we said, and today on a special episode of The Wonder Years <laughs> or something, you know, <laughs> or a, a super special after school special. Um, but no, this really was uh, a special episode. Uh, those who, who have been with us for a while uh, have heard me say it before, even though I don't get to say it often. But um, I love it when we get to do a show that is also important. So not, to, not just the daily content that we put out, which is important enough. Don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not... I'm not uh, you know, devaluing, uh, you know, our daily work. Um, but when you get a, a topic or when you have, uh, that, that's very important, significant. And when you have a guest, um, in cases when you have a guest that has accomplished something, uh, that, that is really spectacular. Uh, those are mom- moments of great privilege for us. Um, because the um, how do you put it? You always want to do good work, but if we can leave things a little better than we found them, if we can uh, find a way to increase understanding between people who are different, if there's a way that we can bring attention. Uh, to voices who don't get heard, um, those specific moments, they're meaningful 
they're meaningful. They, um, when we're done an episode like this, um, when I sign off, my heart is more full than it usually is because the damn fam always fills my heart. So that, that goes without saying, but my heart really, really overflows. Um, because you, it's maybe selfish, uh, but I feel like I get to give myself one or two pets on the back and say, you know what, you, you did something good today. You participated in doing something good. Um, and that matters. That matters. It's, you know, sometimes you got to keep it light, but sometimes you got to do the important stuff. And uh, I can I can't think of anything I mean I, okay maybe that that was maybe a little exaggeration I can't think of things um but of D-Day and observing D-Day and observing the sacrifice of so many and so much loss and pain um isn't something important I don't know what it is. So I'm, uh, I'm this, despite the frustrations, despite the tech stuff, despite the, t the couple of times you saw me go, <laughs> because uh, at first I wasn't able to bring you the show that I wanted, uh, but we did get there. Um, <sighs> it's a privilege. That's all I can say. It's a privilege, and I'm, I'm happy I get the opportunity, and I'm happy that uh, through this venture that uh, Mr. and Grizzly and I started, uh, that I, you know, people like Kit Hugh, um, who is my friend, and I love him very much, uh, but we met through this, um, have crossed uh, my path and are able and willing to help us by sharing their knowledge and their expertise like this. So. Um, I am in a really, really, really good mood, and I'm vibing. And um, I hope you are two kids and cubs. All right, that's the end of this episode of the Daily Beaver Morning Show, D-Day edition. And uh, we hope that you love this, because uh, I really loved making this <laughs> for you and bringing this to you today. Uh, of course, sharing is caring and word of mouth is priceless. So please let your peeps and poops know all about us. Oh, I see Kit Pete has joined us in the chat today. Hello, my friend. Um, word of mouth is priceless. So tell everybody. And if you would like to make sure that you do not miss an episode, you don't have to. Thanks to the Ray Girl. She sponsored our pod page. That's podpage.com slash the true north eager beaver, lowercase letters with a hyphen between each one of those words. And if you make your way to that site and click on subscribe, when we have something fresh off the bandwidth, it will come directly to you. So you won't have to miss a thing. If you would like to support us in other ways, well, then you need to make like Kit Lane and go to the True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated YouTube page, uh, which uh, the kits tell me has had uh, even more subscribers since uh, we have been uh, taking on the show today. I think we're at... Uh, well, my screen says 978, but it, uh, it it may even be more than that. Maybe the kids can give me a total rather than, while we're there. But uh, if you are there, we are trying to get to 1,000 before Canada Day um, so that uh, uh, we can further uh, monetize this. So uh, please, if you can, help us. We would like that. Go to our page, click like, share, subscribe, and uh, that would make us very happy. If you would like to support us in other ways, kids and cubs, uh, the way you can do that is to go to our coffee page where you will find the Eager Beaver Lodge Emergency Hydration Fund, which is our fancy word for our tip jar. Uh, if you like our content and you would like to encourage us to do more, well, you can do that by buying us a cup of coffee, a cup of coffee or a Guinness from Mr. Grizzly, a Caesar or a hot chocolate for me. That, um, well, uh, it helps us produce, write, deliver the show, market it. And, uh, well, you know, we always appreciate a little love. <laughs> because democracy is something that you do. Like Kit Hugh said, 
in uh, the conversation, um, take a time. Take the time to write uh, some letters uh, to veterans organizations, uh, to the Minister of Veterans Affairs, to your MPs, and uh, ask that uh, they keep, that, not that they keep on, that they do write by our veterans and that they keep doing so. All right? Oh, Kid Aussie Pete, thank you for the super chat donation. That's so sweet of you. Thank you. Much appreciated. Um, Sorry, yeah. I was so long being away. Uh, major technological issues here at work, at my job, uh, and my laptop wouldn't boot up because it won't charge. So I had to use my phone, and I lost connection. So it's been a heck of a day. <laughs> uh, Mr. Grizzly, I was telling the, the people on the chat, uh, the kits, I don't know if you were able to hear it, but uh, you, man, the heavy lifting you did today to make this happen. Yeah. It's just no, the just, job. I, I, I'm very grateful. <laughs> Thank you. You saved the you're show. Welcome. You no, saved the welcome. show today. Um, so, uh, kids and cubs, uh, because democracy is something that you do, please write your veterans organizations and ask uh, that they do better. Make sure that they take care of them and that our veterans get uh, that which is due and that which was promised, that we deliver on our promise. Uh, for the service uh, that they gave us. Uh, all right. Uh, also, because democracy is something that you do, if you live in Alberta, please get involved in the NDP leadership race so that you have the best candidate possible for the general election when it comes along. And if you are in Saskatchewan, New Brunswick, or the province of British Columbia, please uh, get involved. Call your uh, local electoral body and see if you can volunteer at a polling station this year. We need good people to be able to do that. And, uh, it's a, it's a wonderful experience. Uh, I've had the chance to do it, and um, there is nothing better. There are a few things better than on uh, voting days, seeing people come to the voting booth excited to vote and wanting to vote. And it's, it's, it just uh, it renews uh, some patriotism, patri patriotism and love for the country. <laughs> so please do that if you can. From the Beaver Lodge, this is your eager beaver saying it could be a tough world out there, so please be kind to and gentle with yourself if we still have Mr. Grizzly. Do you have some yeah. words of wisdom, sir? Yeah, you know, when, when technology fails and goes sideways and creates massive uh, issues, try not to get too upset. Just breathe through it. Get it done. Everything will work out in the end. It'll be all be okay. Nobody's going to be harmed at the end of the day, so try not to let your... your your emotions get the better of you, which because I woke up feeling great, other than being tired, which is standard for me, but woke up feeling great in a great mood with no anxiety, no depression, just feeling like, you know, whatever comes my way, I'll deal with. Right. It's because of that, I've been able to deal with all the technological issues today. So yeah, remember to try and breathe. Remember to try and relax. And remember, all the bad stuff that happens is only temporary. And when it's technology, don't worry about it. Life goes on. Uh, that's a lesson I need to learn. <laughs> 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 ah, all right. Well, then, from the Beaver Lodge, it could be a tough world out there. Please be kind to and gentle with yourself. Mr. Grizzly, please cue the cock. Give me a second here. I, I'm doing this from my phone, so here we go. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, the Misfy Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters, CanadianTarot.com, their uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Peppermaster. Hot pepper sauce is made from farm fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. We are grateful to the Cryer Media Network for its support, Pete Jarvis for our artwork, and Paul Joseph Something for our opening and closing sequence music.
I don't know how. Let's see. I'm going to see if I can end this properly here. I'm having a heck of a time doing it. You know, when all the technology goes sideways. So, you know, here we are.